When I passed my PhD, I cried. I don't mean I did something very British and kept a stiff upper lip and removed myself to a dark corner and composed myself. I howled. <laughs> I howled in public. Now, like a lot of important moments of my life, this moment happened by accident. I was curating a conference very much like this one, and my supervisor was walking in. So, being the sort of person that I am, I opened the door. And he comes in, and he's with a new member of staff. So there's a, a tense moment of adjustment where we make the professional introductions. And I'm thinking, don't look stupid. <laughs> Firm but fair handshake. <laughs> make eye contact. And I'm listening to him, and he says, this is Jess Hartley. Dr. Jess Hartley. <laughs> and he realizes I don't know. And he smirks, and he says, she passed her PhD today. <laughs> I have a feeling that I didn't appear quite as professional <laughs> as I might have wanted. And I think that is down to a couple of factors. The noise, <laughs> as it hit my body. The tsunami of tears that arrived. And maybe it's just me, but I know as soon as I cry a lot, something else is going to happen. Snot. <laughs> there was a lot of snot. I'm not going to lie. And maybe you're wondering why it hit me so hard. I felt it in my body. Because I've worked for this. I spent seven years of my life diligently working towards this one moment. Well, the truth is that up until that moment, I believed, nah, I knew that people like me don't become academics. Now, I bet you're looking at me and you're thinking, there's an academic. It's only the glasses. <laughs> All right? Take those off. I'm slightly awkward, awkward ginger woman. All right? No, I do have a lot of privileges. The colour of my skin opens that door for me that I haven't even considered needed opening because I'm middle class. And that affords me with an expectation and an aspiration. I may be a woman, but I'm slightly unruly woman. What I mean when I say people like me are people who struggle to write. As soon as you give me a pen or a laptop, I am rendered inarticulate. I have been told so many times that my handwriting is atrocious. I'm a doctor now, though. That's only to be expected. <laughs> but my spelling is also atrocious. I'm also someone that needs to move to think. You have no idea how hard it is right now. I'm not allowed to go beyond the red spot. <laughs> <laughs> I need to move to think. And I need to talk in order to know what I think. Sit down. Stop chatting. You are here to learn. And that behavior disrupts the learning of others. I am one of those people who feel ashamed when I give my work to someone else. And I know that this is going to hurt. Now, partially, this is a story about dyslexia. But we're going to leave that to one side. Partially, this is a story about unruliness and what it is to be an unruly woman. And by that, I mean, I don't like rules. <laughs> How many of us do? Right. 
if you tell me not to walk on the grass, I'm going to want to know why. What's so special about this piece of grass? And what's the point of a park anyway, if it's not to run about on? And I'm so busy questioning the rules that I'm walking on the grass. And I'm being disobedient unintentionally. Education is a bit like that. There are a lot of rules. The first one is that you mustn't mention body fluids. Okay. There's also not a lot of laughter in education. There's a lot of rules and there's a lot of expectations and codes about the way that we, that we should behave. People don't often talk about love in education. And snot and laughter and love are so potent that, they're, for me, they're a part of life, what makes life worth living. So, scroll forward a few years. I'm a teacher. <laughs> I started in primary and secondary schools, and now I teach here, in the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. <laughs> Be academic. If I had a pound for every time a student has come to my office, knocked on my door, and asked me to help them to be an academic, I'd be really, really rich. I could have a whole new wardrobe, <laughs> black t-shirts. Maybe they could be cashmere or silk. Maybe not silk, because I'd snot on it. But isn't that interesting? How do I become an academic? How do I change who I am in order to fit a regulated system? These students have learned to be an academic is to not be like them. They have learned that they need to learn a whole new language and behave in a whole new way in order to conform and fit. I had also internalized those mechanisms. We have learned that in order to sound like an academic, we need to use long, fancy words like epistemology. <laughs> and what you must never do as an academic is say the word fuck. Interesting response. Laughter. <gasps> An intake of breath. What I've just done is behave in the wrong way. To be an academic is to use the word epistemology and not use the word fuck. How many of, the, of you in this room understand the word epistemology? Yeah? How many of you in this room know the, the other word? No. The clever bit is knowing the fancy words. The clever bit is knowing that when to say them and how to say them. Both of those words are deeply threatening. But epistemology is the right way to be threatening. But anyone that says it renders a distance between them and the people who are listening. You either know what it is or you don't. And if you don't know what it is, then maybe you feel inferior. Because what we need to do in order to conform to the academy is to speak the words of others rather than the words of ourselves. I learned very early on in my education that I was wrong. And this sense of wrongness led me to feel ashamed of my work. Research on shame by Gersten Kaufman talks about questions of who am I and where do I belong. Questions I hear every day in that knock on the door. Help me to be. Should I be here? Do I belong here? Am I being authentic to myself, Jess? He says that these questions are forged within the crucible of shame. It's a lovely image, isn't it? Education 
utilizes shame as a potent behavior modifier. That is, when I perform an action in front of other people and I receive a negative response for it, I feel shame and I change my behavior. Someone once looked at me and said, is that what doctors wear, is it? And I looked down at my jeans and my sneakers. And I was rendered inarticulate. The true answer to that is, I'm a doctor. This is what I'm wearing today. But the shame of my education stops me from participating in the conversation. Research from Montana State University talks about this very thing. It says that cycles of shame stop a person's ability to believe in change. I'm going to repeat that with a different emphasis. If we continue to educate young people through a cycle of shame, particularly people from marginalized communities who are already being courageous when they face us, then we risk telling those people that their voices don't matter because nothing's going to change. Fuck that. What if we stopped talking about academic knowledge and started talking about articulating knowledge? If I want to learn how to pirouette, I'd probably fall off the stage, but, so let's not go there. If I want to learn it, I am not going to read about it in a book. I might go to Carlos Acosta or Libby Spencer, two amazing dancers in ballet and in tap who really thoroughly and fully engage with the form and the technique. But what they also do is they put themselves within it. And they take their technique to the boundaries of the specialism. Now, at master's level, that's exactly what we want. We want people to articulate knowledge at the boundaries of the specialism. So if I want to learn how to tell a story, I may look at Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie or J.K. Rowling, who changed my understanding of what stories can be through their writing and their speaking and their being. But I may also go to the Aboriginal Australians, whose culture of storytelling speaks of environment and identity. And it is done. It is not written about. It is done. It is the articulation of the knowledge that's the clever bit, not the mode of that articulation. I'm working with two amazingly bright, wonderful, sensitive students at the moment, who I'm going to call Lauren and May. They're both really, really struggling not to turn their back and leave education. Lauren has learnt the scripts of academia incredibly well. She is a high achiever, expecting excellence. In our last tutorial, she hung her head in shame because she was only getting B pluses. And she shouted at me, It's not about me, Jess! She had learnt that in order to be an academic, you needed to distance yourself from the work. That's the correct way of being, in distance. And she was broken by it. May is a little bit different. She's not English, 
And that disjuncture, being in this sort of institution, rubs very heavily on her. She's an incredibly inspiring artist. And when I see her work, I am inspired, and I know, know academia and you. But what she thinks is that when we write a dissertation about it, she's hammering it in such a way that it kills her art form. And she doesn't want that to happen. And neither do I. So I have three key elements that I want to tell you about today that I think are at the heart of rupturing these cycles of shame. The first one is something that I call tact, tactfulness. We turn the student back to themselves with kindness and firmness. We are attentive to that student. Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you here? It is about you. Of course it's about you. You're, you. you're really quite good. I don't know very much as an academic. I am boringly repetitive. It is about you. To such an extent that in our last tutorial, Lauren said to me, Jess, you're such a dick. <laughs> and of course I am a dick. Um, which leads me to my second point. The profane, profanity. Now, my use of expletives and swearing and profanity through this is a clumsy mechanism that illustrates a point. I'm sure many of you will be much more sophisticated than me in how you would perceive it. By profanity, I mean we need to know what is said and what shouldn't be said and why it should and shouldn't be said. And we question that. We dance with that. We question what academia must be for the individuals in it. Profanity, to such an extent that May and I are rewriting what academia can be for her so that it doesn't destroy her art. We are rewriting it in her image. And the third factor in my triad of rupturing things is love. The amazing academic and teacher, Bell Hooks, suggests that love is a political act of rebellion. To love teaching is a political act of rebellion. What she means when she says is that if you invest your hearts in this work, in learning, in the students, that it ruptures this distance that we've heard and brings us all together equally in this mess of learning. So, I'm asking you today to reimagine a university that enables students to articulate knowledge through tact, through profanity, through love, and through snot, so that they learn that they do not need to be ashamed and that they can go out and speak and change the fucking world. Thank you. Thank you.